Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Stella Big. Um, I'm a council member of the Royal College of Surgeons of England um, and proud and excited and interested to see um, what we are going to hear from uh, Professor Neil Mortensen, who is our new president of the um, Royal College of Surgeons. So if I can introduce him um, a little, because his uh, titles are numerous. Um, he um, has been the, he's a professor of colorectal surgery in Oxford um, and has been there since 1987. He trained at Birmingham, Bristol and St. Mark's and has really fought and advanced the um, need for colorectal surgery and the, the ask from colorectal patients. Um, he is president of the Ileostomy Association and past president of the Association of Colorectal Proctology of Great Britain and Ireland and uh, of the RSM. In 2013, um, he became a uh, vice president of the, uh, sorry, 2013 became a council, council member, and then in 2017 was elected as vice president. Um, I now have had um, three presidents of the Royal College of Surgeons, and every year I think, what's going to happen next? And all I can tell you, it's been getting better and better and better, starting with Claire, who was amazing. Um, but in Neil's uh, statement uh, to us, he um, wanted to advance and drive surgery for everyone from patient trainee all the way through to consultants who are in current practice and uh, people who um, are retiring. Um, he has signposted to the new building and our workforce he has come into, um, uh, into post with COVID-19 around us, but his stance on diversity and sustainability and his tagline, which is engagement, visibility and speaking out, I think is going to stand for itself this evening. I also want to introduce my co-chair, who is our Aaron Saha, who is a consultant general surgeon uh, based uh, in Upper GI, um, based at the Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Trust. Um, he is a newly appointed and fantastic um, uh, Royal College of Surgeons of England Regional Director for Yorkshire and Humber. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to launch into questions, which is why everyone is here. And I'm going to give the first question to Aaron, who's promised it's going to be hard. And that sets the standard <laughs> going forward. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, and I just want to say it's a real privilege to be invited to to share this with um, Professor Mortensen and you, of course, this evening. Um, Prof, the college in common with many professional bodies is at somewhat of a crossroads with regards to representing our profession and for staying relevant to all of us. And indeed, some senior figures have openly called for change and a new direction. Where would you like to take the college during your time and tenure as president? And what tangible outcomes would you want to achieve? OK, so even before the George Floyd incident and Black Lives Mattered. Uh, I felt very strongly that um, both women and ethnic minorities needed a better voice in the college. I think repeatedly people have said, what does the college do for us? And those people in London don't really listen. And they're not representative of us either. And uh, they're in a sort of uh, London clubby clique and they're all white men, mostly, and um, it's not really representative of us. So clearly, I think all major institutions, Oxford University, for example, where I am, uh, and uh, many of the other Royal Colleges have all suddenly realised that they can't stick their head in the sand over this anymore, that they have to actually grasp it head on. There has to be a better deal for everybody. Uh, from, the beginning, from the beginning, obviously getting into medical school, uh, getting into surgery, uh, getting into surgical training, getting a consultant post, uh, being a leader in your hospital, being a leader in your specialty, and then maybe getting onto council if that's what you want. It's got to be completely open for everybody. And then within the college itself, the leadership has to be completely accessible for everybody. And uh, if I only managed to achieve that in my time, uh, I will be very well, well satisfied. Um, if I can just go on a second, a little longer. So we have established uh, 
and independent review. Uh, it's going to be chaired by uh, Helena Kennedy, who's a human rights lawyer. Uh, and in the House of Lords, she has, if you like, championed the cause of ethnic minorities and women at the bar, which is also a pretty male chauvinist preserve, you might say. Uh, and she's going to help us work through how we do things better in the college, first of all. And then we'll look at the profession of surgery in a wider context thereafter. There are lots and lots of things to do, clearly, but I think that's the most important in the current environment. Thank you. And I think just as a follow on from that, unsurprisingly, that's one of the, the main things that, um, that, that is the chat amongst the theatre coffee rooms and the deaneries up and down the land. Um, and the, the recent independent review is very, very welcome and very necessary. Um, do you have any thoughts as to what steps you think um, might need to be taken, although I completely appreciate the need to wait for the full review? <laughs> Are there any thoughts that you have about um, some of the first steps that all of us can take as consultants and leaders within our local hospitals to improve diversity? Uh, I think we need to be very open and we need to be very honest and we need to listen. I think um, it's extremely easy to be complacent once you're in the senior consultant position and assume that uh, everything that you've managed to achieve is just as easy for everybody else. And so I think uh, it's really important that uh, all of us have our, if you like, eyes wide open over this issue. And we bear it in mind uh, as much as we can. I know in the middle of a you know really tough operation, your mind's going to be on something else. But I mean, for the rest of our professional lives, I think I think we've just got to bear it in mind constantly. Is everybody having a fair crack of the whip here? And um, uh, I think it's difficult to do. But I I think if the college leadership is saying that, uh, and our message is you know pretty clear and getting out there. Then I hope our fellows and members will be will be doing that too. Jim. I can see that um one of the um the next key sets of questions I think that we're we're likely to get from um from many of our people on the call and indeed up and down the deaneries is about training. Um the as you'll know, the NHS has a contract at the moment with the independent sector hospitals and some of the key issues that have been raised with us as consultants, certainly in, in my hospital, is whether and indeed when opportunity training will genuinely exist in the independent sector hospitals. Um, and also some guidance as to whether or not the length of training may need to change to achieve core competencies. Could you give some thoughts as to where you sit and where the college sits on these questions? And any idea of some of the outcomes of discussions you may have had with some of the other key stakeholders in this, JCST, HEE, and the other independent sector providers? Yeah, sure, of course, Aaron. So um, the independent sector is, is a part of it. I think all of us are worried that if the independent sector is used a lot, it'll become the norm and the capacity in the NHS will be allowed to wither on the, on the vine. We don't want that to happen, clearly. But in the short term, if there are uh, contractual arrangements between the NHS and the independent sector, and that's where the elective surgery can be done, then I think clearly uh, that's where trainees have to be too. But there are lots and lots of issues. And uh, interestingly, I, I was at a meeting uh, last week and all the major players were there. So that was NHS England, Hi. that was the GMC, that was... Uh, Health Education England uh, and representatives of both the individual companies and their, if you like, their lead body of the independent sector. And uh, I was really, really impressed. Everybody in the room said, we've got to make this work. And that was, you know, across the deaneries and Health Education England, the independent sector saw it as their responsibility that they had to do this. And interestingly, the contract which the NHS had with the private sector or the independent sector across the COVID surge uh, didn't have anything in it about training uh, because they thought that it wouldn't be 
you know, very, very easy or possible. So they have now uh, brought in a new contract and the uh, provision for training has been re rewritten into it. And um, uh, so uh, I think there are some high level principles which the college and Health Education England are developing and going to be publishing in the next week or so. And the, uh, the, the man of NHS England, as it were, was going to go away and sort out the operational difficulties. I mean, I know, for example, Spire, as one of the independent providers, has had a bit of a bad press, but they were just going to pilot how they did it in two hospitals, but they were quite sure they were going to allow it to roll out uh, across the piece. Now, of course, it's not just the independent sector, the whole business of COVID and the way in which it's depressing capacity uh, is having a massive effect, isn't it? Um, mm. I think in many places, probably for routine surgery, it's way down 10, 15 percent for slightly more important surgery. Maybe it's getting around 40, 50 percent. But because of all the measures around COVID, because of, because of trying to find covid light facilities, I think uh, it's still very, very slow. So, of course, the volumes aren't there and the opportunities for trainees aren't there either. And I think as a college, we have to. I think that's one of the key issues. I was just writing a little piece for um, the trainee bulletin, which is happening for the second time this year, happened first time last year. And I, I called it collateral damage. And in a sense, training is the collateral damage from the COVID crisis. It's just completely disappeared as people repurpose for other things. Uh, and consultants were doing double consulting, operating in full PPE, and there just weren't any chances. And these, these, the, these poor uh, trainees were kind of doing telephone triage and maybe uh, repurposed in an uh, intensive care unit and all that kind of stuff. So it's been both interesting, I'm sure, and stimulating for some, deeply dull for others. But the whole story has been that training has completely fallen off, fallen off a cliff. So. I think that's got to be a massive priority in the next few months to see if we can, uh, if you like, bring training back on line as much as we possibly can in what will continue to be difficult circumstances. Now, if that means, for example, that um, training needs to be extended uh, or it means that we have to have slightly different ways of assessing people's competency and ready to progress, uh, then all that's under discussion. There are lots and lots of groups discussing those issues. And all, all I would say is if there are trainees listening, uh, I would like to try and reassure them that we are going to do the very, very best we can to uh, secure the best deal we can in difficult circumstances for, for trainees. Thank you. Aaron, I think Stella's experiencing um, sound Is problems. She? Stella, can you hear us? Okay. Oh. Okay. Shall I? Can you hear Carry us? Carry on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's that's really valuable to hear, and I know it's going to be reassuring for a lot of the trainees on the call to hear to to hear the president and to hear the college taking this so seriously and putting it front and centre. It's really appreciated, and I think a lot of us will really appreciate getting some of your idea of the timescales. It's great to know that discussions have happened very recently and that there's an expectation that hopefully some things will be produced in the near future as well. So thank you very much. And that's very great, very reassuring for all of us. I think um, I, well, I've, something I've always valued from all of my senior, senior mentors and my consultants is the fact that surgery is an apprenticeship. We learn so many things by osmosis almost. I wonder if you might be able to tell Tell us about some of the most important lessons you've been taught during your career and perhaps which mentors have particularly inspired you and why, because you will know that you serve as a mentor and inspiration to many of us. It'd be nice to hear what's inspired you and mentored you along your way. Well, thank you very much. And um, again, uh, it's great to be here, everybody. And I hope that um, what I say will be uh, both uh, helpful and uh, stimulating. Um, I'll start off with my very first introduction to surgery, which was the when I went to medical school, 
uh, I was a grammar school boy, went to Birmingham, and on my very first day, I was, uh, if you like, given, in inverted commas, Professor Slaney and a past president of the college as my, if you like, mentor. So this was a kind of pastoral care job rather than actually uh, a teaching, if you like, responsibility. But he basically was there to see that I was okay. And of course, as a surgeon, he, I think, suggested that perhaps I ought to do surgery too. And in my first long back at medical school, uh, arranged for me to go to one of the Harvard surgical services. And during the summer, we did operations on animals. I won't say any more about that online. Um, but basically, it was transplantation research to see if we could make organs last longer. And as a first year medical student, I was giving anaesthetic, I was yes. doing operations, I was sewing up, I was looking after the animals, and I thought, oh, wow, this is absolutely fantastic. This is really what I want to be doing too. So uh, I suppose he was really, really instrumental in getting me want to do surgery in the first place. And he was also a very, very generous person. and didn't take exception when every time he gave me advice, which was, I suggest you go and work in place X, I did completely the opposite. And uh, it was extremely good of him that he still, that he was still prepared to, uh, to carry on giving me advice despite all that. Um, I think then, of course, uh, once you've decided you want to do surgery, then you see people who seem to be able to do surgery very easily. It's like any of these things. It's like watching a brilliant singer or a, a musician. Um, if they can just do it effortlessly, you think, wow, I'd like to be like that. And there were several people along the way who, who, who were like that. Um, and uh, I, I think the technical stuff is made up of little components of all those people you see. You sort of build up a port portfolio of all the little things you'd seen, you say, oh, that's terrific, I'm going to do that. And then your operative sort of portfolio is made up of all those little bits of other people's uh, operations. Um, I think probably to slavishly do things just the way one person taught you is completely inappropriate now, isn't it? I think all of us carry on learning till the end of our surgical surgical careers and uh, there's always new stuff you can learn along the way there's always a new way of doing things uh, there's all, always a new way of approaching a particular piece of anatomy so I, I i think it wouldn't be one mentor but there are people who as well as the technical side seem to also combine some other particular qualities so those qualities would be judgment i think uh, it would be patience and i think it would be uh, academic curiosity and um, again, uh, some of those people along the way have been, I think, particularly influential. I think to be able to combine doing something brilliant technically, but also to have a curious mind and want to research and want to do things better and want to think of a different way of doing them. Uh, and also uh, being, being thoughtful uh, about what they do. I think if we meet people like that, it's absolutely terrific. And uh, of course, if you see people like that, again, you not only want to, if you like, mimic their physical skills, but you want to, if you like, try and be like them. So it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning, in a way, uh, I think all of us have surgical heroes. Uh, we want to be like them. Oh, if I could be like them, that would be wonderful. Um, and that's why I think there have to be heroes of every shape, size, gender and ethnicity so that we have people we can chime with who say, yeah, I'd really like to be like, I'd really like to be like them. I mean, I, I, I think there are surgical and personal qualities that transcend all those things, but I think we need heroes, uh, you know, that work for us. And um, I think it's not one style fits all. There are different kinds of hero. But I think if they combine those particular qualities, I think I think those are the best ones, really. Thank you. I think we've got Stella back online. Yeah, sorry, I've had some technical difficulties. So, um, Neil, thank you for that. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that we, we talk about diversity, but we forget there's diversity within colour as well. So, um, I'm humbled by your background because we, we talk about heroes and 
you see your heroes at the end of their journey and, and they seem to be in places that you don't feel that you can get to. So two part question for you. One is, would you tell us part of your journey? Um, because um, your beginnings are very different to what people may think. And the second part is, what would you say to your younger self? If you're doing this all over again, what would you say to yourself to do? Oh dear. So which bit of my, which which bit of my journey do you want to hear about then, Stella? Where do you want me to start? Well, so can... I, I, I mean, as Stella suggested, I I I, I had a relatively um, humble upbringing in a not particularly attractive part of southwest London and I got to grammar school and uh, by the skin of my teeth I got some A-levels because I was a rather naughty boy and then I got into Birmingham Medical School and then I told you what happened after that. Um, after Birmingham, Professor Slaney wanted me to do anatomy and to go into surgical training in Birmingham. Uh, but by then I'd met my wife, my best friend, uh, also a doctor in the same year. We held hands in the back row and uh, she said, no, I don't want to stay in Birmingham. I want to go to Bristol. So off we went. And um, I then got anatomy training post in Bristol. And in a way, that was a bit of good luck as well, because in the anatomy department was a lovely man who subsequently became in charge of all the preclinical teaching here in Oxford. He was an anatomist, he was interested in endocrine cells, and um, he said after the anatomy demonstrating year, which we all used to do in those days, um, why don't you look after the anatomy department for a year, because I need to go to the States and do some research. And I said, no, I want to get on with my surgery, I want to get on, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to hang around. Um, but he said, well, actually, what, what, you know, what are you interested in? So, cut long story short, there was some endocrine cells in the in the stomach which nobody knew anything about and they made gastrin which sort of uh, promoted the secretion of, of, of uh, gastric acid um, and so I did some research on those so there I was incredible one year in anatomy a second year in anatomy and it needed a bit of writing up and a bit of polishing and stuff but within those two and a half years or so, I had an MD. So I went out into the surgical world as an SHO with that under my belt already. And it was completely, if you like, luck. I mean, you take your chances, don't you? But it was luck because if I hadn't gone to Bristol and, 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 and that wouldn't have happened. And then um, in the uh, surgical training program in, uh, in Bristol, um, it was the days when you were allowed to get on and do things without a great deal of supervision, shall we say. There was some extraordinary, extraordinary stuff we were able to do at a very young age, which I think now probably wouldn't be allowable, but it was absolutely incredible, practical, surgical, if you like, experience. And um, I think what I felt very strongly then was that if I was going to be a bit of an academic surgeon, and I've never been a really cracking academic surgeon, but if I was going to be a bit of one, I had to have, if you like, surgical respectability. I had to be able to show that I wasn't just a talker, I was a doer too. And I think what was great about surgical training in Bristol and the Southwest then was that you actually did huge amounts of surgery. One of the years was down in Exeter, and as a senior registrar in Exeter, I operated almost every single day for 12 months. At the end of it, I was completely sick of operating, which was pretty unusual for me. And, um, you know, would have very happily had a, you know, had a break. So there we are, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of good fortune. And then I was a senior lecturer in Bristol. I was a consultant on the staff of the Bristol Royal Infirmary for a little while. And then somebody in Oxford died. A man named Emmanuel Lee, who was a surgeon in Oxford and, his colleague said to me, would you like to come and take his job? He did a lot of inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer and that kind of stuff. And so I, uh, that's how I ended up in, in Oxford. So a lot of, you know, bizarre, strange episodes of, you might say chance or fortune, or, you know, you, you might say you have to take your chances too. And then Sarah asked, well, what would I do if I, saw my young self, I think I'd say, 
be patient. I think I was very impatient. I was very. I don't think I. I don't think I was unpleasant to be with, but I was very, very single-minded, and I didn't have a great deal of time for hanging around. I was there. We are. I was impatient. So I think I would say to my youthful self, I would say, try and be a bit more patient because you'll still get there in the end, and you know probably it'd be more enjoyable too. It's, and I think it is that concept. Small steps just make the the bigger picture, um, and people just need to remember, as I say, to to take it slow, especially in the days of now. Aaron, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I was going to. It's um, it's fascinating to hear the interplay between surgery and academia and taking your chances. Um, and I think it's a lesson for for all of us, really. Um, one of the to my mind, one of the most successful parts of the college and one of the ways it's been so good at engaging with um, junior members has been the research fellowship scheme. Um, yeah. And many of us um, have really um, benefited from that. And combined with kind of the global um, aspirations of the college as well, and the brand and the reputation, I just wonder whether or not there's a way to, whether you had any thoughts about integrating those two, whether or not we could think about overseas research fellows or, other things that we could that the college can offer members abroad well it's a very interesting question actually i think uh, obviously the old colonial idea of us going out and teaching people how to do operations is a thing of the past isn't it i i think you you know there are there are centers in in india for example which have higher volumes of liver transplantation yeah liver resection for example than we'd ever see in the UK and I think for example at that level doing clinical fellowships again in the present COVID environment impossible to organize but you know we're all keeping our fingers crossed that it will you know will go away one day uh, so at that level yes and then in terms of uh, of the research side then yes already Dion Morton when he was our director of research has begun to get together some research fellowships which are across the world in the kinds of questions which, if you like, developing countries uh, want to be involved in. And um, obviously, I think some of those research fellowships do involve some of our, if you like, uh, UK uh, research fellows going out to uh, other countries and working there and, and doing a piece of research. I think equally well, I think they have a massive responsibility to share. Uh, I think we'd find it difficult to say the very best health service in the world, but it's a very good one anyway, to share what we what we do in the UK and the way we do it with uh, with surgeons from around the world too. I've always absolutely adored the whole business of sharing surgical time with colleagues from around the world. And one of the things we had in Oxford was a was a terrific scheme for inviting surgeons from other places to come and join us as fellows and the discussions around the operating table were absolutely incredible uh, cultural sporting um, geographical everything you can think it was a fantastic education so again I think um, I, th I think um, all of us should think very carefully about our international responsibilities I think we can't just, you know, even even if we've got problems here in the UK at the moment, um, Malawi, for example, only has two urologists. Uh, you know, we can shrug our shoulders and say that's too bad, or we can see, you know, we can see what we can try and do 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 about it. If our attitude is, I think we have a responsibility to the rest of the world, uh, then uh, uh, I think the college will will do something about it. We are trying to develop at an academic level, uh, a relationship with the London School of Economics, which has obviously a big international footprint. And if we could combine, if you like, research and policy around um, value for money in surgery, for example, in uh, developing medical environments, and the best ways of doing that and sharing best practice from us and learning from them too, I think that would be absolutely brilliant. So yes, I think global and research still have to be right up there as part of what we do. And, and Neil, just following up on that question. So I know this is dear to your heart. So 
we have a question from a general surgeon from Egypt who says, um, I'm a general surgeon. I'm trying to continuously improve my um, skills through many methods. The college courses are wonderful, but actually, please, would you decrease the fees for courses provided in low-income companies? Does technology, um, and certainly the, the advent of COVID has made you think again about technology, but is there an opportunity to use technology to drive down costs of courses? I think it's a fantastic opportunity. And, um, you know, clearly, uh, even at a sort of committee level, having a committee meeting by video conferencing, maybe the nuances, the social interaction, the networking isn't quite the same, but um, at, a, at a giving information level, it works incredibly well. It can be at the time people find most convenient for them. They don't have to travel. There's no cost involved. The actual provision of the, if you like, teaching program and module costs. But on the other hand, uh, it's nowhere near the same cost. So I think you're absolutely right. It's a fantastic opportunity for us to be able to, to develop our whole, uh, it sounds a bit grand, digital offering. But I think uh, the, the business of going into the new college building a sense of a new start, a sense of modernization. Uh, I think uh, I think COVID has helped us really give that a kickstart, and I hope we don't give it up. I mean, for example, um, uh, you know, we're doing this now in a way which would just not have been possible otherwise. And I think, although it's, I have to confess, rather intimidating uh, and a bit terrifying, and all the rest of it. I think it's it's a fantastic opportunity to for, for us to share together uh, where the college is going in a way in which it wouldn't have been possible uh, uh, formally. I mean, maybe everybody trekking to London, hearing somebody standing at a desk, giving a giving a talk and so on. I think in a way this is much more accessible. This is much more, if you like, user friendly. It's less, uh, if you like, standing on. Um, ceremony isn't it i think it's it's more informal and in some ways that's great Thank i you. absolutely agree that the um uh, the coronavirus pandemic has made lots of people and lots of groups think very differently about how we do stuff and to my mind one of the things that really stood out um is just how it, in our hospitals in our regions um across the country just how many different groups of people have worked together in a way that they perhaps hadn't before um, and although people may have disagreed with some of the official guidance that was produced, um, it was very inspiring to see all the colleges working together with all the specialty associations to produce some guidance. Do you think that's something that you might want to see continue into the future? Um, often we're not divided as such, but we're, we're defined by our colleges, we're defined by our specialty associations. Do you think in future years there might be opportunities for the colleges to come together and be together and work together. They already work together in education, but in terms of seminars and teaching and um, future outputs. Very, very good question. Of course, it could be a political question too, couldn't it? But well, let, let's just take it at the level you asked it, all right? Um, <laughs> we had a meeting of the Joint Sur Surgical Colleges yesterday, and uh, two or three things came out of it. So, for example, already at an intercollegiate level, we are developing a cosmetic surgery certification. Uh, we tried a, a version of it already over the last two or three years. It hasn't quite worked. And um, this is at the instigation originally of Bruce Keogh, who asked us to see if we could do something about uh, cosmetic surgery and the way in which, in a sense, there was a degree of anarchy out there amongst the both the people who were doing it and how they were trained and how they were cred credentialed. So um, we've got that going. That's an intercollegiate uh, uh, enterprise. It's just been revised. It's going to launch again in the autumn and it looks as though it could be a success. I hope it will be. And again, that's a great intercollegiate uh, 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 offering. Um, yesterday, we discussed uh, a GERF report about endocrine surgery. Endocrine surgery is a kind of funny animal because it spans many many specialties um, and in a sense that's partly the reason why it's a bit disorganized and lots of people have 
uh, you know, an iron in the fire and there's tradition and history and people don't want to give stuff up and all the rest of it. But the Gurf report clearly points out that A, uh, all the surgery that's going on isn't properly being put into registries, uh, that B, the more complex endocrine surgery conditions aren't being dealt with very well and being dealt, dealt with in very small numbers, um, and, uh, and that C, there needs to be a better look at the whole business of, for example, thyroid and parathyroid surgery. Now, we agreed that at an intercollegiate level, we're now going to take that on. We're going to convene a group of all the specialist interests, and we're going to come up with some advice about how best to organize endocrine surgery in these islands in the future. And I think, again, that's just one example uh, of, the, of the kind of thing we can do. You're absolutely right. I think during the COVID surge, um, we recognized that there needed to be stuff done between the colleges. Of course, everything was happening so quickly. Uh, if I told you we had we had uh, meetings, um, well, almost every day, three times a week minimum, um, and pieces of advice would come out from whoever, NHS England or Public Health England, and they'd say, well, we want we want this turned out in, in 12 hours. And, you know, it was maybe six o'clock on a Friday night. Incredibly, incredibly difficult. And I just want to pay tribute to Derek Alderson, my predecessor, who had a really, really tough call in those three months when the surgery was at its highest. There was stuff coming at him from all over the place. We tried to help as much as we could. It was incredibly, incredibly difficult. But I think what we learned was that actually we can turn around things quickly. We don't need to wait till the next committee meeting three months later before all finally ponderously deciding what we should do. We can actually turn around things quickly. And again, I think uh, video conferencing webinars like this have taught us that we don't need to wait for the next committee meeting. We can be, be more agile and more flexible. And um, again, I think that will help advance the intercollegiate cause. I think it will make it more difficult if we are talking to each other all the time for any particular college to take umbrage about what another college has done. And it's daft, isn't it? I think when, you know, when the profession's under such pressure, when it's clearly going to be very, very difficult to get going again in a normal way, I think that, um, you know, for us to be fighting with each other and speaking with different voices, it's completely ludicrous. And I think at the very highest level, um, I think we as presidents need to take that responsibility really seriously and make sure we're not wasting our time on stuff like that. So there are lots of, uh, if you like, uh, uh, projects in the pipeline, both at a teaching level, at a organization of surgery level, at a uh, I've got a sort of guidance level, and I think you can take it from me as much as we can. We're going to do stuff on an intercollegiate basis. Great. Thank you. Shall I come in there? So we've got lots of questions coming in um, from our uh, people viewing this evening, all sorts of areas. So uh, let's kick off. Congratulations and welcome to our new president. I know that you're passionate about well-being and, and the mention of the illness and wellness conference that we held last year. How do you plan to highlight the challenges and risks to well-being and proactively put in place to start something in this area? Um, well, so just joining our council is um, Peter Brennan, who's an expert on the whole business of human factors. Uh, we've already done a bit of work already on uh, a uh, if you like, a presentation day on well-being, which we'll carry on doing, I think. Um, I think the college has a duty not just to make sure that everybody's the best technical surgeon they can be and the best professional they can be, but I think the best all-round person they can be. If in your heart you're chilled by a, you know, a problem with feeling depressed or not getting on at home or um, feeling you're being... Uh, uh, disadvantage in your career pro pro progression, then inevitably that comes out either in an operation or the outpatient clinic. You know, you're short with somebody, or you know, you take you take you take a um, 
you, you, you know, you take, you take a quick step through an operation which is inappropriate. I mean, all these little things add up. So I, I, I think part of surgical excellence is, in a way, looking after ourselves too. I think we have to be uh, the best human beings we can be in the operating theatre, as well as the best, if you like, technical surgeons we can be, because, you know, it's the relationship with the rest of our staff too. We've all heard, we've maybe seen the odd surgeon who's been pretty snappy with the staff and the phone instruments and all the rest of it. I'm sure it doesn't happen in any of your hospitals. Um, but, you know, that is inappropriate, isn't it? I think, I think we have to really, really look after our folks. I always used to say, and uh, I think it was sad. I always used to say to my uh, to my uh, to my colleagues and my trainees, really, really, really be careful to look after yourself. The NHS won't look after you. The NHS, in a way, is a bit brutalising. Uh, and I'm glad now that the college is, if you like, partly taking on that responsibility to look after us too. Um, I think it's a difficult thing to do remotely. We've been, we've improved our helpline, for example. We're beginning to talk about well-being as an issue, as we have done in that first uh, day-long conference. I think we'll be doing it more. We'll be looking more at the way in which human factors, in the in the way in which I've spoken, you know, help uh, and make a difference to 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 how procedures either go well or go badly. Um, and um, again, there are lots and lots of things to do, aren't there? But I hope that. This area will also be an area that we uh, improve on as part of the college offer. Um, everybody, all the specialist associations, of course, have to justify their existence too, and quite right. And they'll be doing all the technical stuff. They'll be telling you how to best take out a gallbladder and stuff. The college probably shouldn't do that. The college should be, if you like, the overarching uh, uh, a body that looks after the, the complete surgeon, if you like, and I'd like to see that happen. Thank you. Um, we've got a question now from a, a past president. We've got quite a few past presidents on the uh, webinar this evening. Um, so the question from Laura Biro is, what representation are you making to use the Nightingale hospitals either for elective surgery to deal with the waiting list or as a way of moving out COVID patients to allow the NHS to return to normal practice? So lots is the answer, Bernie, both with NHS England and the Secretary of State. We are having alternate weekly uh, four or five college presidents meetings with the Secretary of State. Um, the Nightingale hospitals can't be used for doing surgery because they don't have the right ventilation system. I agree you probably could parachute in a field hospital, but it maybe wouldn't have the capacity necessary. I think that there is a uh, discussion about using Nightingale hospitals to do colonoscopies in large numbers, for example. Uh, and yes, if the uh, Nightingale hospitals are kept on, which they are going to be now, I think until January or February was the last I heard, that their extra capacity can be used to free up capacity for um, surgical endeavor. I think. Uh, we're still, if you like, making up this as we go along. I think the whole business of providing a COVID light environment for uh, high volume surgery is still a bit of a challenge, isn't it? I think all the stuff around getting the right patients, having the right staff, having the right staff bubble in theatre, having a good and reliable COVID light, if you like, facility. In some places it's easy, in some places it's very difficult. But uh, yes, Bernie, I agree, we do need to keep the Nightingales and um, that's what's happening so far. <laughs> and of course, uh, Neil, the, the Nightingale centres, because they're so big, they lend themselves to be fantastically socially distanced training centres. So when we're all starting to struggle for, with large spaces, the question is, could we use them as big training centres? Well, it's a very good question. So, for example, the um, uh, the Nightingale in Glasgow, I think it's called Louise Allen, is going to be used, we think, for socially distance part two examinations of some kind in the autumn. Um, this is, again, COVID permitting. Uh, if there's a massive surgeon, you know, it's everywhere, that would clearly be impossible. 
So uh, the first parts can be uh, online, we think. Second parts, the plan at the moment is to have the exams in a socially distanced way with fewer, uh, if you like, uh, um, uh, uh, examination points along the way. Um, so that's that's an example of one way of uh, of using the Nightingale hospitals, and um, I think the uh, College of Physicians have already used the Louise Allen, uh, or are going are planning to. And uh, again, our plans at the moment include using the Glasgow facility to begin to restore our examination function in the autumn. So, yeah. Lucy, any more questions? Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know whether um, everyone on the panel would like to answer this one. Uh, so one even learns from um, trainees rotating through your firm. Do you agree? And what has been your experience of this? Well, I shouldn't start. I think Aaron should start. What do you reckon? I absolutely agree with that. I think it's a really good point. Um, in fact, a, a colleague and friend of mine, Mark Peter, I work with often says that the best judge of what you're like as a consultant or as a supervisor is from the registrars and how they feed back, feed back to either you or your colleagues or the deanery. As once we become consultants, there's a danger that you get relatively fixed. But as registrars mm -hmm. come into the unit, they bring what they've learned from the hospitals they've been to. And no matter how well read you try to maintain yourself, it's very difficult. And registrars mm -hmm. that come in and say, oh, Miss, Miss so-and-so does it this way, Mr. so-and-so does it this way, you can always kind of learn those tips and tricks. Also get an idea of what's around in your region. You, you get to learn what people do from the registrars and so on that come in, but, but also they keep you humble. They keep you on your toes. They keep you on, always thinking and learning and reading. Um, and absolutely, I um, think that our department is enormously enriched from our trainees. We're very lucky in Yorkshire to have an excellent training scheme, excellent group of trainers and really excellent trainees. I absolutely agree with that. Anyone who isn't able to take that training on board or that learning on board, I think is all the more deficient for it. And Stella? I'd have to completely agree. And I think I think it's not just the um it, it's not just the senior trainees, it's medical students, it's anyone who comes into your environment. You learn all the time. And it's not just technical, it's how to use social media and I, I often am given a tip and think gosh I've spent hours doing that could have done it a different way um, and actually even social life you know going out and buying your team a drink and you know going out for a meal together and I'm hoping we can do that again actually that camaraderie and the, the ability to signpost each you know people to different mentors um, and actually keep that surgical family or the NHS family going is uh, incredibly powerful but Neil we mm. need to hear what you think well, I, again, I think Aaron's answer was fantastic. I can't better it. Um, I think it is called the surgical team, isn't it? And I think um, part of working in a team is learning from each other. And I think that I completely agree. I think for, 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 for many uh, surgeons appointed to a consultant post, it can be rather lonely because you don't see your colleagues operating necessarily very often, although I'm a a very strong ag advocate of double consultant operating. I think we need to do it more. But in the absence of that, I think having um, trainees with you and learning what they have heard from others, again, that comes back to my original point about continuous education. I think it's absolutely vital. And I think, again, for a senior surgeon, let's say, to say, uh, this is the only way you will do this operation, and it's like this. I think it's completely inappropriate. I think um, we need to talk about every single little thing we do and be sure we're doing the best we can do. And by listening to our colleagues, whether senior or junior is the way we do it. I'm struck recently, um, particularly with talking about our trainees, um, things that happen in the, in the national press, things that happen um, that really we have much less control over, sometimes almost split us apart from our trainees. The recent pay award that was announced yesterday has been um, very heavily criticised by some of our junior doctors um, who really have worked incredibly hard during the COVID surge. They've been redeployed without complaint. Um, I've been absolutely really in awe of 
of what they've done uh, and what they've been put through. And for many of them, the, the pay award that doesn't include them had been very difficult for them, which I can understand. Um, are there things that you can think of that all of us need to do as surgeons to try and protect our team and try and really make them aware of just how much we value them? One of the things I always benefited from was the old firm structure, for example. Yeah, I think team meetings, team outings, um, um, listening to everybody's point of view. Um, don't dominate the conversation, either the, if you like, the surgical conversation in theatre. Um, be very open to what everybody else is suggesting. And a point I used to always make, and again, this sounds as though I'm blowing my trumpet, but I would get the mop and I would mop the floor after the case. And of course, after my cases, there was quite a lot of mopping to do. But um, <laughs> it, it kind of it kind of shows that, you know, we're all in the team together and nobody's too high or mighty and we all have to share around the jobs. And of course, it's easy to say that in, um, if you like, in a webinar when, you know, in the real world, there are there are clearly major irritations and problems and blocks and all, all the other things. Um, but we won't keep our teams unless we have that kind of approach and we can't do our job without teams. Um, I think, uh, you know, I was saying in a, in a discussion group the other evening, I think we got complacent about surgery. We felt that, you know, everybody out there wants to be a surgeon and they'll just roll up, but it's, it's actually a bit more difficult. I think people are seeing surgery as uh, rather more challenging and not quite so good for work-life balance and maybe the kinds of people in surgery aren't the kind of people you want to be with and all that stuff. So I think we've got a bit of a selling job to do for surgery too and and if the students for example and the junior trainees see that what they're part of is something that's a great team with very very good team spirit, energy, enthusiasm, I think that's attractive, it's seductive, people want to do it. So um, it's what we have to do, I think. I think Lucy's got a few more questions that come in. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a question with regards to um, diplomat ceremonies and how they're going to work, bearing in mind no one knows when the pandemic's going to fade. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm going to be able to share with you that I am the first ever president of the Royal College of Surgeons who has been sworn in, in inverted commas, virtually. <laughs> um, it was a bit bizarre, wasn't it, Stell? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we managed somehow. There was no donning and doffing. There was no, uh, not PP on this occasion, but, you know, wigs and hats and gowns and all the rest of it. No medals, nothing like that. Uh, but we managed. And, um, of course, part of the ceremonial, part of the diplomacy or diplomate uh, 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 ceremonies is, if you like, part of the history of the if you like the the deep tradition of surgery which people are beginning to become part of it's like a kind of you know it's 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 like joining this long historical tradition of people who've wanted to try and make people better by doing surgery and it is really sad if we can't do it in person and so rather than trying to do any uh if you like virtual diplomate days which i don't think would be very satisfactory. It's all on hold at the moment. On hold till when? Difficult to answer. I mean, we might as well say, why do we wait till we get into our new building? And what's happening about that? Well, we probably will get the keys by March, April. Then we've got to do lots of moving. So probably we're not going to be having any proper meetings in there till maybe June, July-ish. So probably, by the time all that's sorted, and again, COVID willing, in terms of what special arrangements we might need to make, probably can't shake hands, have to bump elbows. Maybe in the autumn of 2021, I don't know. I mean, none of us have got any idea at the moment, and it just depends, depends what happens to the virus, I think, really. <laughs> Lisa, you gonna squeeze another one in? Yeah, of course. So, um, uh, congratulations on your role, um, and this is from another president, interestingly. Uh, what's your view of how we can prevent another Patterson? 
Well, I mean, of course, the college always says it's not a regulator. Uh, it is a nudger and encourager. And um, I think that uh, if we're if we're more able to talk about the things around the edge of surgery, it's going to be easier to speak out about things which we don't feel are right. I think part of the problem has been surgery has been very hierarchical. Uh, we have, uh, if you like, once you've got to a consultant job, you've got autonomy and you can get on with it. And we have been careful not to criti criticize our colleagues to patients and to our colleagues. Uh, it's kind of been part of our honor code. Um, but I think we've got to get better at doing it. I think if people don't, if you like, fess up and put their cases into registries, if they don't make their outcomes widely known, if they don't share in uh, multidisciplinary team meetings within the hospital and the wider surgical community, if they are being a bit of a lone wolf, a bit of an outlier, I think we have to speak out. And um, I think it's very difficult though, isn't it? I think we don't want to get it wrong. Uh, we don't want to scapegoat people. Um, but on the other hand, I think we have to have an environment where it's much easier to speak out, where it's much easier for us to be able to say, I'm not you know, making any kind of personal criticism, but I don't think what's going on here is right. Can we have a chat about it? So you know, the college has got some guidance about that. We're actually working up um, a set of guidance about managing uh, difficult colleagues. I think we're probably going to use stronger language than that. But it'll give guidance on how you do say, look, Mr. Patterson, I don't think what you're doing is right in a way which is acceptable and a way which has some kind of, if you like, protocol behind it to allow it to develop into a proper conversation and be properly managed. I mean, we don't want things to get to the stage of the independent re review mechanism, uh, which in some ways is better than nothing, but, but too late. Um, I think obviously the Patterson thing was more than just surgery. There were obviously pathologists involved, anaesthetists involved. There was a private hospital or two which probably had some reason for wanting, um, you know, the, the particular person to carry on using their facility and so on. Um, I think probably in surgery there have been people who are on the edge of, well, we wrote, we wrote a piece in the bulletin, which was very, very widely read, are surgeons psychopaths? Now, mm -hmm. most surgeons aren't, frankly, psychopaths, but to do what we do, we are, you know, we are slightly strange people, aren't we? You know, we take people apart and put them together again. And um, it is an extraordinary business, an extraordinary privilege, and it can go to our heads, and we can think we're walking on water, and that's the beginning of the end then, really, isn't it? And I think, it's about, if you like, projecting the kinds of surgeon, uh, so, 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 surgical behaviour which is more acceptable, which um, allows more open discussion of things that go wrong and things that aren't right. Um, easier said than done, I completely agree. It's, um, it's fascinating to hear you, hear you say that and I think that Again, so many of the things that we've touched upon today are things that are talked about in our coffee rooms up and down the land um, amongst all of us as surgeons and trainees and students. Um, and actually, it's been great to hear you touch on so many things that the college does, because one of the things that I've heard most in my re very you know few weeks as a regional director so far and first few months is people are unclear as to what the college's role is to, to, for them personally. It's fascinating to hear you say it's not a regulator. And I think a lot of people wouldn't particularly appreciate that. So to all of the, all of the members who are watching now and to anyone who might dial into this later, what, what do you think are the key things, just to conclude, that the college does for us as members and, and how best do you think they can engage with the college in the future? Well, obviously we do, you know, the basic functions are the exams and the teaching uh, and the, uh, if you like, uh, leadership. I think, um, I would like to see uh, people feeling that they need a lifelong relationship with the college rather than just an examination relationship. We can all remember queuing up, can't we, and waiting for our results and then buzzing off and never going to the place again. I think, again, uh, you know, 
uh, it's been a theme throughout the evening, hasn't it? That uh, new technology, video conferencing and so on, will make it easier for us to play a part in surgeons' lives if they want it to, uh, from the college uh, in a more immediate way. You don't have to get on the train and 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 trek up to London or whatever. Um, obviously, with a new building, I think people will want to come and see it, and they will want to come and see, you know, what the new surgical offering is all about. Um, and uh, I think that uh, clearly we're engaging more in social media. That's been a big change in the last year or two. I think that helps our membership understand what we're about. I think clearly uh, being more accessible like this, as you've said, allows our membership to, to see what we're all about. Um, I think one of the things we want to have a really good look at is our regional, if you like, offering. I think it's been seen to be London centric. And I think, again, using things like video conferencing, it is much more possible to visit Huddersfield for the evening and have a chat and find out what the difficulties are. Oh, talk, to your, you know, talk to your medical director and say, you know, we as a college, we're not regulators, but we are leaders and we want to promote excellence in surgery and brilliant outcomes for our patients. And the way in which we can do it are, you know, all the things we do, our standards, our, uh, our training programs, our, uh, our, our teaching seminars and all the rest of it. Um, maybe there should be something along the lines of you get your FRCS. And again, this is completely off the cuff and nobody's done anything about it yet. And I'll probably get shot down for saying it, but <laughs> maybe you get your FRCS and every five years you have to, you have to either online or in a webinar or even come to the college, come for a refresher. And the refresher will be all about, you know, what the college is doing in various areas and all the soft stuff, the well-being stuff, uh, the professional standard stuff. Uh, and then you get your big tick and off you go again and you can carry on with your FRCS for another five years. Now, what would be good about that is that we could hear from you, you know, what we're, what we're not doing well, what we should do better. But also it would mean that the college still had a bit of influence. I think that's part of the problem. Do the FRCS, get your exam, buzz off. You're out there as an independent uh, surgical uh, consultant, and maybe there's a tutor, maybe there's a regional advisor. But really, you know, I'm just getting on with doing surgery. I think um, we need to be more present in people's surgical lives. I don't mean in a horrible way. I don't mean looking over their shoulder or anything like that, but just more present. And we'll be there more present in social media. We'll be there more present. Uh, in uh, meetings like this um, and uh, I think people will see that the college actually a cares for them and b has something to offer in terms of speaking with government and speaking with all the various agencies involved just like I've said for example in trying to solve uh, you know the issue of trainees in the independent sector during the current you know during the current crisis I mean somebody's got to do that for you all uh, and I think maybe and again you could tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe people have seen that during a time like the COVID crisis, actually, you do need a college. Uh, you do need somebody with the overarching, if you like, leadership authority to try and sort out these big issues for you because you can't, you can't do it on your own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Neil. So um, I'm supposed to be summarising and concluding. However. We're really looking forward to working with you and um, it's going to be a delight, I know. So I'm going to leave you to sum up. What would you like to say to everybody who's on this call, your final words? My final words are, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm going to try extremely hard to be your president, not the president. And by that, I mean uh, listening and changing the things that need to be changed. And obviously in the short term, trying to get through this rather bumpy patch due to the virus. So good night, everybody, and thank you very much for listening to me. I have to say, I'm not usually one as having some Scandinavian background or sitting and talking about myself for quite so long. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much for doing this this evening. It's been fascinating, and I hope people realize that we may be NHS heroes and uh, maybe presidents of the college, but actually, 
people are normal people and have normal lives. Um, and actually, we do understand each other. We just need to give ourselves time to do that. But really looking forward to working with you. And thank you to everyone who has been working so hard in COVID. But actually, now that COVID has been to ebb away, we're all exhausted. Now is time it's going to be even harder. We've got to work even harder to carry the backlog through. So thank you also for the time now going forward. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night.